approximately five minutes.
Praise the Lord, everybody. Hallelujah. It is good to be in the house of the Lord today. Amen. Glory to God. Well, thank you, Jesus. A little bit crazy on the wind there factor. Now, I stepped out the door and said, it's Wednesday, piglet. Um, just a real quick announcement, uh, Friday, April the 29th, 7 p.m., uh, Whole True Tabernacle at 2932 East 21st Street is celebrating their 20th anniversary, so you are invited on Friday night to come out and join them uh, for their anniversary service, amen, hallelujah. Let's fix this before it drives me crazy, hallelujah. Hallelujah. All right, let's uh, go to the Lord in prayer right now and invite him into this place. Lord Jesus, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for your goodness and your mercy. We thank you, O oh God, for another opportunity to be in your presence. We invite you, Lord, to have your way in this tabernacle. We pray that you would be high and exalted, that your train would fill this temple. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Let's worship the Lord here this evening. to be praised. Glory to God. Glory to God.
Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. He is worthy. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Glory to God, glory to God, glory to God. You may be seated. It is good to be here tonight. Hallelujah. Good to have each and every one of you here in the house of the Lord with us. Those of you online, thank you for being here. God bless you. Give us an amen. Hallelujah. All right. Uh, we do have some prayer requests and uh, uh, just a quick one here. Let's remember to pray for Brother Jerry, his lungs. He also has some unspoken requests they'd like us to pray about. Uh, so let's not forget that. If you have an unspoken request yourself, you would raise your hand. Hallelujah. Let's go to the Lord right now and ask Him to have His way in each and every one of these situations. Lord Jesus, we thank You for who You are. We thank You once again, Lord, that You are the healer, that You are the deliverer, our strong tower, our rock, our fortress, our defense, our shield. You are the all in all, the all-sufficient one. And Lord, we ask you right now to touch every need in this place, both spoken and unspoken. Lord, you know every situation, you know every need before we're able to ask or even think. And Father, we thank you, Lord God. We give you the praise. We give you the honor as we watch, oh God, you touch lives and hearts and heal bodies, save souls, deliver lives. And we thank you for it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Hallelujah. At this time, I'm going to turn it over to Brother Rusty. I've asked him to bring us the word here tonight in Jesus. Praise the Lord. Um, we're going to start with an I Quit match. An I Quit match. The I Quit match is a famous WWE wrestling match where the only way to lose is to say the words, I quit. It doesn't matter what you go through, ladders, ladders, tables, and chairs, oh my. You can get knocked out, you can get sent to the hospital, the victory is still yours. As long as you don't say those words, I quit. Likewise to your walk with God. It's a subject we talked about on Sunday night. We are overcomers. Amen. We must not quit. The title of my sermon is You're on Fire. Um, it was like the Lord, the Lord gave me a word in my sleep and it was zeal. And then um, I thought of the, then it was quickened to me, you're on fire. And the, the terminology of it was I had an NBA game on the Sega Genesis growing up that if you scored three consecutive points, they yelled, you're on fire. And so we're talking about having a zeal for God again. Amen. If you want to stand up for the reading of the word, it'll be real quick. It's Proverbs 24 and 33. I'm just going to go ahead and read it rather than waiting for you. Look for it. It's real quick. A little sleep, a little slumber. A little folding of the hands to rest. You may be seated. This scripture is a warning for the ages. It's a reminder for us all that we can't slip back into this, eh, I don't care about having a reverence for the things of God anymore. I don't care about what I say while I'm in the house of God. I don't care about what I say out side of the house of God anymore. Eh, God will forgive me. Anyways. I know that it is hard to deal with politics and the ways of this world. We can't keep continuing watching things on our devices that you're not supposed to say yourself. Just because you didn't say it doesn't mean you're not responsible for bringing it into the house of God and defiling my sanctuary. I'm going to keep reading but God gave me this as, as I written it. So when I say stuff in first person, I'm not saying that this is my sanctuary. This is the Lord speaking to you guys. To all of us. I want you to stop and bring the acceptable sacrifice called worship. Bring back that love and feeling. Bring back that love and feeling. Bring back that love and feeling, now it's gone. 
Yawn, yawn. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Yeah. Uh, he said, bring back that love and feeling to the house. Don't be afraid of getting that zeal back into God. That zeal that wants to see that awesome move of God work into your everyday life. It's easy to worry about others walk with God, especially in the ministry. So often we get weary because we tackle the needs of others. We say to our, unto ourselves, there's no time for myself to get a renewal. When it is a must that you come for the oil and the wine, first before giving it to others. How are you to clothe and feed the multitudes when you are naked and starving yourself? Yes, naked and starving. Dirty rags, the Bible says. We need that sanctification that says, I am clean. Come up to the altar and get what you need, each and every one of you. No one is greater than the other and no one is lesser than the other either. So when you are saying that you're not worthy for the blessing, you're just whistling in the graveyard. No one is worthy for my sanctification. No, not one. But this is your rest and restoration. You must get the oil touched by the pastor. Yes, no one is going to cheer you up to this altar, but you must make that decision every time yourself. What? You don't want it? What do you mean you don't want my blessings? Why are you here? Don't you know that I am the Lord and I know your heart and what it says? You think you're fooling others, but they know as well as I do because I give the saints the discernment to understand the things of God. They are working on my behalf to bring the mysteries to you. So why do you say I'm offended by them? You're not offended by the saints of the living God. You're offended in me. You don't want to hear that I am one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. You want to control the boat, but all you are doing is rocking it and people are falling out because of it. I don't want you to leave. I want you to stay. Come and get what you need for my name's sake, and I will bless you. You can't get better on your own and by your own way. You have to lay down your pride and come get it. Come and kneel before me and confess I am the Lord. Confess that, I, that you are not perfect and screwed up and you need a Savior. And I will heal your land. Confession is the first step. Every saint has had to do this. And those who haven't are whistling in the graveyard with you. There is a people who worship me the right way. And you're tired of hypocrites, but you're one too. Don't you see that? That I'm the way, the truth, the life, and nobody will get to the heaven without me? So, so why are you fighting me so hard? You come because heaven sounds delicious, but my ways bewilder you. No one is perfect, only God. And that's why you need my Holy Ghost. It's not a one-time application, it's an everyday seeking supply. You can't have it without a fire in your soul. Does my word not say that I will take you hot or cold, but lukewarm I will spew you out of my mouth? Don't say that you don't have this hogwash. Didn't the people out of the land of Egypt have to conform to my strict statutes at the time of old? And since my son died for you, you're good. Come on, snap out of your fantasy and worship me. My yoke is easy. But this world will drag you down. Why do you want to serve such a horrible master? Have you not tasted his lies and deceit long enough? Worship me. Love me. Like I've commanded you do, to do since the beginning. Am I not worthy? Am I not worthy? I have laid my life for you. So lay your life. And I will give it back to you. Don't be afraid. I am right here. I will help you. That is what the Holy Ghost is for. To help you. Come and receive it and I will help you. Become the man or woman you always were supposed to be. Nobody is perfect. 
is a perfect man, then fails at life. They have been broken since birth, birth, and until you get that rebirth in the Spirit, you'll remain broken and undone. Let me reform you into the holy man and woman I have called you to be. Come on. Praise the Lord. Um, there's three things I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about an abomination. I'm going to talk about the curse. And I'm going to talk about damnation. First, I'm going to do some groundwork. An abomination is, the definition is, a thing that causes disgust or hatred. And a curse, the noun, noun version, is a solemn utterance intending to invoke a supernatural power to inflict harm or punishment on someone or something. And then a ver- the verb is, um, it often seemed as if the family had been cursed. And so I think that's the sentence, maybe. And then damnation is um, com- uh, condemnation to eternal punishment in hell. And they got in parentheses that that's the Christian belief, but we know that that's true. And so um, abomination is just a representation of sin. Abomination will separate you from God. Sin, likewise. See the similarities because they are cinnamons. Uh, curse is how God punishes us. Adam, Eve, and the devil and the earth were cursed by God after eating of the forbidden fruit. Damnation is a permanent punishment. Uh, Mark sixteen sixteen: He that believeth that is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Uh, 2 Thessalonians 2 and 12. They... they that they all might be damned who believeth not the truth, but had pleasures in unrighteousness. And then Jude 11 and 13, They are damned, for they follow in the footsteps of the king. For profit they give them, themselves over to Balaam's heir. They are destroyed in the uprising of Korah. And these people are like jagged rocks, just below the surface of the water, waiting to snag you. When they join your love feasts, the feasts with you, with you without reverence, they care only for themselves. They are waterless clouds carried along by the winds, fruitless autumn trees, twice dead, uprooted. Uh, wild waves of sea foaming up their own shame, wander, wandering stars, for whom the darkness of the underworld is reserved forever. And so, um, so I'm going to start with the abomination. So abomination gets a bad rap. Um, we like to, um, in bold letters of abomination, target certain sins like homosexuality, murderers, adulterers, those big sins. But really, ab- abomination, the abomination of the, it's like, what, nine letters, maybe? It's, it's so big and intimidating. But we'll hear that word sin, and we're like, oh, that's so cute, little three little letters, sin, sin. And, you know, and then, you know, you always hear somebody saying, oh, yeah, I stole a cookie out of the cookie jar today. Mom never found out. And the other person would say, sinner. <laughs> you know, they, they just brush it off. But sin is sin. Sin is abomination. Abomination is sin. And it separates you from God. It doesn't matter what you're doing. God hates it. And so then we're going to talk about the curse. The curse is a consequence. Adam and Eve had a consequence. God called it a curse. Um, Cain was cursed after he killed Abel. It was a consequence. The curse is a consequence. Consequence is a curse. And then there's damnation. And damnation has, um, it's the, um, the judgment of hell and brimstone, which is damnation. And damnation is judgment 
and hell and brimstone. So we're going I'm going to talk about some stories. The first one is about Jonah. And Jonah was a preacher. And he was well known and he liked that part. But there was a town in a city where he had a bad experience and he didn't like them very much and they didn't like him. And and God called Jonah to go preach to Nineveh. And <laughs> Jonah said, "I ain't going over there." And God said, yeah, you are. You need to go over there and preach to them and tell them that if they do not repent, I'm going to destroy them. And Jonah, again, he didn't want to do it, and so he ran. And he went to the most obvious place where if God couldn't find you, that's where he went. He didn't go hide behind the closet. He didn't stay at home and just say, I quit. Jonah took the 100% effort to run from God completely. Amen. And he went all the way to the middle of the sea. And God found him and, and brought a storm. And Jonah knew what the storm was about. The men didn't. They were just terrified. Oh, here, here's our fate for being fishers, men. But, this, but Jonah was different. Jonah knows, oh, dang it, you found me. Oh, man, you found me. And so he looked at the fishermen and said, God has found us. I've been running, and I need you to throw me off the boat. If you kill me and throw me off the boat because I'm too scared to jump off myself, if you just throw me over, the storm will stop. Because God coming after me, not you. And they said, okay. Woo! And they threw him over. And this was Jonah's way of thinking. If I die in the middle of the sea of the most uttermost part of the earth, God can't find me now. And God sent the fish, fish taxi, swallowed him up, and threw him exactly where he needed to be. And, and that is the truth of all of us to know that we can't run from God. If Jonah was not successful in the middle of the deep blue sea, why do we think that we can be successful from hiding from God? But we do. Just like Jonah did. And Jonah went and he got spit out on the shore. And, um, you know, full of algae and all that stuff. And he starts walking and um, ringing his little cowbell. <laughs> God's going to destroy you if you don't turn away from your wicked ways. God's going to destroy you. And he started preaching. And Nineveh did the most craziest thing that Jonah didn't think that was going to happen. Because Jonah goes up on the highest cliff outside the, the deal and he was like, Fourth of July! Woo! We're going to see some fireworks. I mean, he was excited about this, that God was going to destroy the, the town that he hated. And so God, was thank, or God blessed him for going and preaching to Nineveh. So he sent one of those thingamajigs for shade. What was it called? A what? A gourd, yeah. I tried to remember that, but I couldn't remember. I didn't look it up either. Shame on me. But it was a gourd. And it... And all of a sudden then, after he gets the shade and he's watching, he's getting bitter because God's not destroying Nineveh. And so that worm, that canker worm, took his shade away. That's another example that God gives and He takes away. Amen. And there, there is the blessing and then there's the curse. And God blessed him with shade and then He cursed him with no shade. And um, then God talked to Jonah and said, Jonah, he said, did you not run from me? Did you not try to kill yourself or get people to kill you? <laughs> but yet I saved your life with a whale or a fish and spit you out and you're still alive under shade. So why, why was it okay for me to do that to you? But it's not okay for me to do it to everyone else. 
why isn't it okay? And <laughs> Jonah, he just said, I would rather just die, is what he said. But we sometimes want to see judgment upon everybody else. But God just wants to save everybody. We got to get on that same page with God that we start, you know, yeah. Let's, let's get saved. You don't have to keep walking on this tightrope that you're walking on. So we're going to go to the curse. And, and the, the curse, we're going to talk about Lot. We're going to talk about Lot. And Lot was Abraham's nephew, and he wasn't supposed to come. And, but he did. Abraham said, yeah, you can come. <laughs> and there was a problem because Abraham had a pure heart towards God and teachings, and Lot was, had an eye for the things of this world and had a rebellious spirit. And somewhere along the road, everything was happening. The honeymoon stage was great. And then somewhere the, their strife was happening. And I can only imagine that it was, you know, why are we here? We could be way over here. Why are we doing it that way? That doesn't make any sense. Abraham had a spiritual mind and Lot had a carnal mind. And finally, Abraham prayed about it and he went and he talked he said listen we we obviously don't agree your group believes your way and my group believes my way let's separate and not have this division and so why don't you go ahead and i'm going to take a step back and you pick whatever direction you want to go and i'll go the opposite and lot pinched the bible says it pinched his tent towards sodom and you know the story, you know, uh, Abraham had to go save him once. And then they, he ended up being the keeper of the, of the gate. And they ended up having a deal. And God went to Abraham and said, listen, I'm getting ready to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abraham's like, oh, Lord. Will you save ten righteous people if there's ten righteous people? I think it was 50 at first. But... He was, he was pleading to God that he would save Lot without saying, will you save my nephew? Come on. And so God made a promise. I don't know if he said it out loud. Yes, I'll set a determination that Lot would be saved. That he would make a way out for Lot. But Lot was carnal minded. Even though he knew a little bit about what Abraham taught about who God was, he was still way lost on the way of thinking about the things of God. And... Um, God came and they, are get, they, want to, they want to defile this man that they think is a and Lot goes oh leave him see Lot tried to save God We're, he tried to save God who here can save God so that's what Lot tried to do Lot tried to save God and he, didn't, he knew that he was the angel of the Lord and he's like here I sacrificed my daughters for the Lord. Now, the Bible says of the likes, and we're talking about damnation. He said, it's better for a millstone to be around your neck and be thrown in the middle of the sea than to touch the like ones of one of them. Lot was, they were his daughters, and he was going to let them. And so that was the carnal mind. And if there was a little bit of inch of, of compassion for Lot for that moment, it was just simply because of his carnal mind and what he was thinking at the time. And it was, I know that this guy is good. I know he is good. And we need to save what is good. And, but Lot was, was salvaged for one reason and one reason only. And that was because Abraham prayed for him. That is the reason why Lot was salvaged. And because... God was angry with Sodom and Gomorrah. Amen. He was angry with them, and he had it. And he looked at that family, and he said, I want you, I'm getting ready to destroy this whole city. You go and out, and if any of you look back, I will turn you into a pillar of salt. Come on. 
and one of them looked back. And the salt she is still today. And we look at Cain, and we look how disgusting it is to kill a brother. Yet God cursed Cain and put him on a road of consequence that maybe that he would turn and love God and start following his statutes. God didn't destroy Cain because he could have put him in fire and brimstone right there at the moment. But he wanted to teach Cain a lesson that maybe he would learn like Jonah did. He, he, a teaching moment, Cain, you're going to be a vagabond for a little while and you are not going to ever be able to sow what you are sowed because you are full of pride and you wanted to show me what you could do rather than giving me what you were supposed to give me. And so now I'm going to now I'm going to have you go beg and for compassion from other people. And I'm sure that changed Cain. We don't get to hear about what happened to Cain after that. We don't know what his judgment was after that. We just know that he was cursed. But it doesn't say anything about Cain being damned. Well, maybe. I think I read some scripture in it. They are damned for they follow in the footsteps of Cain. But anyway, there is that chance where you can still repent and you can be good with God. Think about somebody who just killed somebody and how powerful it would be if they came up to the altar and asked God for forgiveness. There was a man that he said he was a thief. It was that character's deal, and he gave his testimony. And he would, he would go into people's houses, and he would steal TVs and everything. And they went, and him and his buddy, and they went in there, and they felt this spirit saying, we better not go in there. But they, and um, somebody died. Somebody, I mean, it, it just went bad. And he said that he went on his knees and he just prayed and asked God to help him out. And he got, God took him, he, he got baptized in Jesus' name, and he, he'd been saved. He saved him. God saved this guy from judgment, but the other one wouldn't come. And he went to jail. But the other one was forgiven. That's the power of the altar. That that God can move mountains that we can't see. We can say that it's unfair that that guy got off scot-free being a participator in it. We can do that all night, but who's going to say that God's judgment is wrong? We're not. And so, once again, Cain got to still live life, but she's still a poor... A polar assault. Pillar assault. The other one, we're going to talk about Samson. And Samson was a guy that was very strong. There was Solomon that was very wise. There was Samuel that was very anointed with God. And then there was Samuel that was very strong. Samson, sorry, did I say Samuel twice? I'm sure Samuel was strong within the anointing. But it was Samson. And Samson was very strong, and he was the judge over the Philistines. And they hated him. And they wanted him to die. And they brought tanks and elephants and all sorts of things. And they couldn't stop him. You know I'm paraphrasing, but they brought everything, and they couldn't stop them. And so, there was something that was noticed, though, by the enemy, that Samson was sleeping with the enemy, and the enemy knew this, and they bargained with that lady and said, hey, if you find out his secret, we'll pay you. Oh, okay. Okay. And so Delilah went, and she goes, tell me your secret. And he's like, oh yeah, tie me up with green rope, and my, my covenant with God is done. And I'll lose my power with God. 
And so they tie, they tie him, she, she ties him up with green rope and um, then calls the enemy. Now see, let's not leave Samson ignorant. She came and brought the enemy to the house and said, get him. He's all yours. And he goes, Brah! and he beats them all up. Draw, draw. And he goes, yeah, I still got God's anointing. And she did it a couple more times. And, you, you know, and then finally uh, the uh, enemy is getting kind of worn out and ticked off with the old Delilah. And I'm sure that they put the pressure on her. And she goes, oh, you don't love me. You don't tell me the truth. And I can just imagine how prideful Samson is at this point. Is He's starting to wonder if it really is God's anointing or not. That maybe, maybe it, this could be a test to see if Maybe I could beat him up without God's anointing. And so they come, and uh, she shaves his head. She tells her, he tells her the truth. Um, you know, my hair is what saves me, or that gives me the power with God. If I lose my hair, I lose my power. She showed her true color two to three times before this moment. All the warnings, all the signs, yelling in the street, why are you doing this? And the curse was that he was in sin, and he was prideful, and he was proud of it, and he, he was boastful, and God said, okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. And there was a curse that came with it, a consequence. A big consequence. And the consequence was he lost his eyes. And they took him into an arena, and they, uh, thousands of people showed up to watch him get humiliated from everybody. Remember, this man is a hated man. He was judging everybody with truth and with power. And they wanted to stop it like they wanted to stop Jesus. They wanted to stop it. And finally, they found out how to, and now they were going to humiliate him in front of everybody. There's something to say about the people who do evil. That just the here a little, there a little of people. Like there's a person there doing evil, and there's a person there doing evil. But there's something to say about a group of people, of a multitude, to come and watch the evil, especially if it's God's anointed. God, they didn't know. They didn't know. I'm sure not everybody knew that his head got shaved off. Or, or they did, but they didn't know that that was what gave him the power. They probably denied it if they heard it anyways. Because they don't want to believe that God is better than them in the first place. So all they know is that this guy is shaved and he has no eyes and they're going to throw food at him and humiliate him. But Samson said, Lord, please Avenge, avenge me. I know my folly. I know that I did bad. But will you please avenge me for what they're doing? And God said, yes, I will. And he gave him the power back enough to bust the whole, the whole arena down. And the Bible says that more people died than, bef than him judging the people of Philistines. Died. That tells, tells you that there is a great judgment upon people who like to watch the evil going on. And um, they were damned. Their judgment came and they were damned for messing with the anointing. It, David, David explains that with King Saul. He says... Um, because King Saul died, and that guy, go, then he fell on the sword, and he goes, I helped him fall on the sword because he told me to help him. 
And so I did. And he thought he was going to get a reward. And David didn't know that Saul wasn't anointed by God anymore. That he was an enemy of the Lord. David knew that he was the anointing of God. And he says, what? You killed the anointing of the Lord? And that guy was damned. He died immediately. He was sent to death. And so it's very important that we pay attention to those things. Let's go ahead and stand. Praise the Lord, everybody. Hallelujah. Glory to God. It is imperative that we understand, one, we are sinners in need of God. Two, never touch God's anointing. Hallelujah. And three, we cannot be just spectators. We need to be active, seeking those who need Him. Because He wants to save everybody. It's not His will that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Father, we thank You tonight for Your Word. We thank You for this opportunity to be in Your presence. We invite You, O oh God, to touch our hearts and our minds. Help us to hear and to receive from You. God, help us, O oh God, to understand that Lord we're not better than anybody else that we too are in need of you and God I pray right now help us oh God to lead people to your truth help them to see your ways to see your face and become more like you and we thank you for it we give you the praise the glory and the honor in Jesus precious name Amen. Let's worship the Lord here tonight.